It was my younger brother, E-Man, a lanky guy of six foot who picked me up from the airport. As he hugged me, I could tell that he was deep in thought about Edong, our youngest brother. I was scared and anxious about what awaited me at the hospital. Blank faces full of shock, weary from worry, and sleepless nights looked at me as I walked into the trauma ICU waiting room. But no one spoke. A hug from my mom, whose eyes were bloodshot. An embrace from my dad, who could not bear to look me in the eyes. A tight squeeze from my older brother, Ben, a muscular guy, who towers over me and seemed far from present. The faces of Edong's friends and our family looked at me as if pleading for this crisis to be a case of mistaken identity. My family and I left them and headed to the conference room so I could be filled in. It was Ben who broke the silence. Sis, they couldn't save his leg. I had to let them take it this morning. It was his leg or his life, and I chose his life. I screamed at my family as I sat there, shaking in my seat, tears running down my face and snot dripping off my chin. My parents, my mom was overcome with grief. It seemed that at any moment she might have a nervous breakdown. She walked, no, pulled, pushed, and used me as a human crutch en route to Edong's room. Room three, in the very back corner, a small room that could fit no more than two family members at a time, and cream-colored walls held up to technology that was keeping my brother alive. It smelt like a mixture of blood and fresh linens. And there was constant beeping and alarms going off as nurses and doctors constantly ran in and out. My mom gripped my arm as tight as she could in her fragile state. Edong looked like he was sleeping. Edong! I pleaded. No response. He was just lying there. His chest was going up and down to the beat of the loud life support he's on. His right leg was missing from just above the knee. His stomach was cut open, but not bandaged, because the doctors needed immediate access to his internal wounds. Road burn was all over his stomach, all over his shoulders. Both arms and his left leg were in full cast. Tears were coming out of his eyes, but no response. I am a facts-driven person who tends to keep asking questions until I fully understand a given situation. I also pride myself on my ability to take emotion out of high-stakes situations, which is a skill that tends to cause a lot of long-term suffering. I decided to take this approach because to feel the emotions in the moment was too much to bear. So when the head doctor walked in, I blurted out, can you tell me what is going on with Edong? I'm his sister and I have a PhD in biology. <laughs> I wanted this man to tell me the truth and I needed him to know I understood what he would be saying. With what seemed like excitement, he told me Edong was a medical phenomenon. They believed the fact that he was 23 and athletic contributed to his survival. During the accident, Edong's right leg was essentially amputated internally as his pelvic bone was completely detached from his sacrum. His femoral artery was severed and the doctors could not stop the bleeding. They amputated his leg above the knee because it had died from lack of blood. He told me the goal was to get Edong out of the room he was currently in, one of two rooms in the trauma ICU that was fully equipped to resuscitate an individual if they coded. This would be a huge victory for Edong. Less than 48 hours prior, Edong was returning home from work on his motorcycle. When the light turned green, he was the first vehicle off the line. According to witnesses, he was going well over the speed limit, so when the man coming out of the neighborhood sped out trying to beat the oncoming traffic, he didn't see Edong until it was too late. My brother was taken away by medevac, barely breathing and unresponsive, and the man that hit him walked away with minor injuries. It was E-Man, my younger brother, who called in the middle of the night to tell me the tragic news. My partner and I flew in the next day. Tons of Edong's friends, along with countless family members, gathered in the waiting room, but no one knew that Edong's leg was gone. 
So those that prayed were praying for his leg to be saved. Though I'm not one for prayer, I needed these individuals to pray the right prayers. After another family conference, we decided to share the developments of what was going on. And like me, each person was taken back by the news. Eyes went left and right, up and down, to the far corner of nowhere and back, searching for what to say next. Many hoped Edong would wake up and we'd hear his laugh again. His former teammates and workout buddies hoped he would play football again and join them in the weight room. I clung to the idea that like my mom, Edong might be the one sibling who makes it to the Olympics. I hoped that my brother would be able to be that comeback kid, but feared he would never be able to climb up a ladder for his roofing business, be able to walk or dance, and that none of the ladies that were swarming to his side would love him in his new state. I worried that I would have a brother that would wake up and be angry at the world, angry at us for not fighting harder to save his leg. And I spiraled into thinking he would be an opioid statistic. By day three, Edong had had five surgeries and the last of them was a huge success. As a result, they were able to move him from room three to room 23, a less equipped room for someone who codes. This was the victory we needed and it kept the hope alive. My brother was gonna be okay. In March of 2015, just four months before Edong's accident, I went to Oklahoma with my partner, Kim, to visit my family. It was the first time I ever brought home someone I was dating, and I was extremely nervous. Along with the rest of my siblings, Edong made Kim feel like a part of the family. He joked and laughed with her and invited us to hang out with him and his friends. After we left, Edong called to tell me he thought she was a wonderful catch and that he was so proud of me for showing off my love for her. In the months that followed, Edong regularly checked in to see how we were doing. And like most summers since I went to college, we began to plan a trip for him to come see me. I spoke to Edong the day after my 30th birthday, hours before his accident. Yo, sis, so I know you must be upset I forgot your birthday. But can we just move past that and you tell me what you got into on a Tuesday night? <laughs> I laughed. <laughs> and the anger I was feeling towards him was lifted. In the waiting room, Edong's friends shared countless stories about him. One of his friends told me about a recent cruise they had all taken. During the trip, it never failed for Edong to perform some sort of prank daily. One of the largest was when he single-handedly lifted a couch and placed it on his friend's bed. No one quite knew how he did it, and it took two people to remove it. This was compared to the worry Edong had as he searched high and low for souvenirs for my family. As I sat in the waiting room listening, I looked out at all his friends holding each other and laughing at the stories that were being shared. They refused to leave their forts that were created from waiting room chairs. They were devoted. It was obvious the type of man Edong was, one who put his friends and family before himself. And there we were, doing the same for him. Throughout all of this, Kim was at my side. She made sure I didn't get too overwhelmed by calls and texts, ensured I ate, cuddled me as I cried myself to sleep at night, and made sure I got out several times a day. During one outing, I remember walking around the duck pond outside the hospital. As we sat in the grass, a duck waddled straight up to us. Unsure what it wanted, I reached out with a leaf. <laughs> it made no move toward it, but refused to break its gaze from us. That duck just stood there and looked at us, almost as if it knew we were in distress. Under the shade of a tree, I felt comforted as Kim and I held each other and shared the space with the duck. For some reason, this interaction had such a calming effect on me, where prayer never did. By early afternoon on day five, we were called into a conference room with the head doctor and Edong's nurse. 
Your son is going to die if we do not take him to surgery. His potassium levels are beyond the levels that they should be, which is a sign of tissue death. However, to move him into surgery is risky. If he codes, there is nothing we can do to save him, though we will try our best to resuscitate him. He's on three different heart medications and is not responding to them because of the potassium buildup. My mom is a nurse, but through my brother's time in the hospital, her knowledge of medicine was nowhere to be found. Faced with this information, she was silent and just stared at the table. She began to shake her legs rapidly as if to rock herself. Had she not been sitting, I am certain she would have collapsed. My dad looked confused and asked the doctor to repeat himself as if what he said was a mistake. My brothers and I looked at our parents like small kids, hoping they could tell us everything was going to be okay. I wanted my dad and mom to have the right answers to be the adults that had the right answers but that never happened i can't remember who said it first but we all agreed Edong should go to surgery while they prepped him my mom and dad wandered around or my mom was wandering around like a meth addict shoes off hairy mess mumbling to herself pulling at her clothes and picking her skin i stared into a painting of a field which had four trees of pastel colors I like art. This was a piece of shit. <laughs> I hated this hospital. It was dank, sterile, and death was knocking everywhere. Nearly six hours later, Edong was being wheeled out to surgery. He came out surrounded by an army of nurses, one for each of the five machines that were keeping him alive and two for the bed. They paused for us to bid him well. We all surrounded him, kissing him, telling him we were there and to keep fighting. I anxiously paced back and forth as they continued on their journey to the operating room, watching until the door shut behind them. It felt like they had only just gone to surgery, maybe 15 minutes or so when the head surgeon called my family to the conference room. He was in scrubs, a dingy green color, and dance goes. With a measured voice, he said, your son's entire intestinal tract is dead. I'm sorry, but there's no medical intervention we can do to save him. I just stared. What will you do for my son? my dad said with a smile of terror on his face. There is no more we can do for him. You can take him off life support or he will die on his own. My mom looked at me with glass eyes and said, dream? It pained me to tell her this was no dream. I ran out of the room only to have my legs give out from under me. As I crashed on the floor, I began screaming my partner's name, Kim! For five days, I kept myself together. However, in that moment, I just cannot keep the agony inside anymore. There was no peaceful passing surrounded by family for Edong. Instead, Kim, who my brother claimed as family just four months prior, volunteered to hold Edong's hand as his nurse took him off life support. Family members took my mom and dad home as my brothers and I waited in the conference room for Kim to confirm the time of death. As we waited, no one spoke, and we avoided looking at each other in the eyes. I wanted the nightmare to end, but it didn't. It's been almost two years since Edong died. Now, as my birthday approaches, I'm sucked back to the hospital. The accident, the duck at the pond, and Edong's death. My birthday is tomorrow.